Thanks, man. I think we're good. Okay, so my name is Aaron Freed. Um, I've been helping out with the conference this year, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today uh, for short-term medical mission sustainable collaboration strategies in VR. Um, so we have Jocelyn Wu and Dr. Nick George here with us today. Um, Jocelyn is the daughter of a Myanmar immigrant father and American-born Chinese mother. She witnessed different health access realities through visits to Southeast Asia. Her academic interest in communities and institutionalized oppression was initiated by an undergraduate sociology course that culminated in a month immersion in Via El Salvador, an urban district of Lima, Peru. The experience reframed her understanding of home communities in both Tacoma, Washington and Omaha, Nebraska. She graduated with a BS in biology and a minor in justice and peace studies, medical anthropology and piano performance from Creighton in 2012. Prior to medical school, she spent a year in Latin America after studying Spanish and Mary Knoll in Cochabamba, Bolivia, she returned to Lima to work at Ciudad de los Niños as a middle school educator. During that time, she became interested in maternal child health and empowerment through accompaniment of women at the community soup kitchen and child care center where she had originally worked in Biel Salvador. Jocelyn has founded and facilitated workshop and long-term partnership outreach models, including co-founding the My Community Health Collaborative in Omaha, Nebraska, leadership in Project Kira, Creighton student-run medical service learning organization, uh, project coordination for the Institute for Latin America Concern, the Dominican Republic, a service learning immersion in Ghana at Saboba Medical Center, and co-directing the Global Health Conference, the one you guys are all at, in 2014. Her interests are sustainability in healthcare education, addiction and pregnancy, and addressing violence experienced by women through OBGYN care. She will complete her MD at Creighton University School of Medicine in 2016. Dr. George is a recent medical graduate from the Pontificia Universidad Católica Madre y Maestra in the Dominican Republic. Dr. George has dedicated himself to providing medical services for vulnerable populations and researching low-cost strategies and technologies targeting resource-limited areas of the world, focusing specifically on Central America and the Caribbean. His undergraduate studies at Creighton University include majors in biology and Spanish and a minor in public health. During college, he participated in service learning immersions in rural areas of the Dominican Republic and a public health internship in Costa Rica. Both of these experiences initiated his interest in global health. In medical school, he was awarded a grant funding in collaboration with PUCMM faculty for a project looking at the technique of cell block preparation from PAP in liquid medium to clarify the results of atypical squamous cells and atypical glandular cells. His most recent research involves work with the cancer epidemiology in Hispanic Latino populations of the U.S. Currently, he's an MPH candidate at the Gilling School of Global Public Health at the University of North Carolina, and he continues to further his work in global health and migrant health in the U.S. So we're uh, lucky to have these two with us today to talk about their experience um, in Latin America, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. That was a very um, thorough <laughs> introduction, way more formal than necessary. Thank you so much. Um, my name's Jocelyn, and we're going to be talking about our experience in the Dominican Republic with respect to sustainable collaborative strategies. Um, first, before we begin, though, I want to say thank you so much for being here and your existing advocacy work for global health. Um, I want to reinforce the importance of it at this time, especially in our nation's history, where there's been political policies of exclusion. And I hope that this weekend you can find light and inspiration to continue the work you're doing. Dr. Gray. <laughs> So first we already got some introduction. Research regarding global health question. Um, we're going to talk about the context of the present present health care and all that. 
Nelson. I think the word sustainability and collaboration have often have become sort of buzzwords that we use in global health many times to capture this sense of like together. Um, but it's challenging to define it and, and enact. I wanted to speak briefly about the photo that I chose. It was challenging to decide which one, um, but I chose this one because I felt like it represented not only myself and my co-leader when I was in the Dominican Republic, but also um, the community health workers that were critical and vital to the success of our intervention. Um, on the right is Mesadita. She put aside time to cook for us when we were in the DR. And on the left is Chilo. He's an independent coffee farmer in Carizal, which is a rural community in the Dominican Republic. And the picture I saw too. Oh, it's a very robust introduction. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> So what's going on in the literature now? Well, there is a big difference of, of these medical tankers. So some people are getting this, they have a background in this. This is a pictorial representation of search terms that were used by a UMKC researcher to identify publications regarding global health trips. As you can see, um, although this is not exhaustive, there are many terms that we most likely have each used to describe our global health endeavors. Uh, the most common, it, the size of the word corresponds to the number of times that it came up in the text. Um, medical mission has was found to be the most commonly used term, um, but other terms that may, you may or may not have heard that were used to describe global health experiences included volunteer, humanitarian medical intervention, surgical brigade, brigade, ear camps. There were different terms. Surgical safari was our favorite. <laughs> So as you can see, there's a broad variety of terms that capture the variation between many of these interventions. So, uh, uh, ask them, um, what I really want to So this year there was a study done at the University of Michigan um, and also Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania that looked at host community or volunteer organizers preferences for trip design and compared them with host community recipients and what their preferences were for trips. Um, so this table is meant to show that when um, what they did is they identified 1200 international organizations in the US that did work abroad and they did an online survey about 600 responded. Um, what they found was that the preferences of organizers tended to look like maybe trips that many of you have either gone on or considered going on going on. Um, they were shorter in duration, one to two weeks. Um, in general, anyone was welcome to come. The preparation was generally based around travel advisory, vaccinations, ensuring that packing was appropriate. And then the purpose of the trip was for direct medical service intervention. This was at odds with what the study found to be uh, the preferences of host community organizers. Um, 
host community or a staff, um, the surveys were conducted through a series of referrals. Uh, they asked 55 nurses, community health workers, doctors in various countries, including Ecuador, Ghana, Niger, um, what their preferences were. And they found that organizers preferred to have longer trips. There were at least three weeks um, with the preparation stilted rather than travel advisory to language, um, work expectations, um, and also work conditions. Um, and then they, they stated that actually what was what the desired intervention was was more along the lines of capacity building so training education um and then also there's a note with evaluation um the preference of community or sorry volunteer outreach organizers was that evaluation was like marginally important whereas for host community advisors they wanted to be um involved actively in this process of evaluation for an intervention so like if we look at the right column this is all sort of captures perhaps what our ideal hopes for a sustainable and collaborative trip are. Um, but we like constructed this understanding with the, the knowledge that it can be very frustrating when you have a very high hopes um, for yourself personally to participate in a sustainable global health experience, but either for reasons of like slow organizational change, the limitations of your role or what resources are available in a country, it can be difficult to actually execute and implement this uh, with the organization you're choosing. So the reality is that often our personal mission is at odds with our hopes for sustainable change and how we implement it. Um, the purpose of this talk is not at all to paralyze you or like throw you into a deep existentialist crisis if you're already planning to go on a short-term medical mission trip. Um, it's that we hope to pose some good questions that you can take with you when you go on whatever trip with whatever organization you're going on to help you be able to support when you do have tools to do so. That being said, a few questions we feel are important are the following. So first, um, when you're looking at an organization, what is my organization's role in the community where I'm going? And then second, what is my organization's goal? Along the same lines, um, for personal questions, what is my role in my organization's presence? And then what are my personal goals and expectations for this trip? And then the cases that we'll share with you later are hoping to address this last one. How do I work practically and sustainably? in various global health intervention context, intervention contexts. Really help address And that kind of that Looking at the different specifically, any non and um, that NGO map is very helpful. What's out there? Um, this is from a specific search for a health organization. A bigger number popped up, in now. but there are also organizations that are picked from this map. Um, so it's important to understand what NGOs are on, but probably more important what the actual health 
how they help. So in the Dominican Republic, and other countries have this model with um, the public you have the first level, which is primary care gauge, one of because first they are assigned on the look up and from there, one second where you can either and those are and last actually last. So, the public sector model is patient and it's very expensive, um, theoretically, works, but there are certain gaps. That's something that we see in the US and internationally. Here we have organizations. So the cases that Nick and I are going to present, like after this slide, are um, from our experience with the ILAC Summer Program, which is, like many other nonprofit organizations, a separate and essentially closed system that functions um, parallel to the Ministry of Public Health. Um, so ILAC specifically serves to meet certain unmet diagnostic, medical, and surgical needs of the rural Dominican Republic. Um, with a similar referral system that has triage clinics that seek to draw in and then um, funnel patients into these 10 to 15 surgical mission teams that come throughout the year. Uh, the structure of the program is in collaboration with Creighton University and participants receive about six months of formation lightly before departing for a one month long service immersion. Um, the day is structured as morning triage clinic and then an afternoon session with home visits. Um, it's important to recognize with this intervention uh, that it's truly unique in that um, much of the fac facilitation is done by an existing network of Dominican community health workers whose presence precedes the arrival of students and also persists after um, in order to facilitate this referral system. So I tell you this because this is going to be the context of the next part of the presentation, which will be a series of cases. Um, the, go ahead. So can I get a volunteer to read the first case? <laughs> Reading and I'll bring you the mic. Okay, awesome. Evaluation is told to be available. What questions ask? So, what I like now is for this row forward, the partner group, and then back to the group, they have four groups. This row back. And then go forward. And we're going to take four to five minutes to discuss yeah. what important things are and then how you do it. Interdisciplinary, so whether we can have our goal, we'll share. Um, they can. Yeah. Our facilitator, sorry, our facilitator had to get suggested. You're welcome to form circles with your chairs. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
That's kind of dying. <laughs> okay, I hear the conversation beginning and maybe dying. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I just want to emphasize that although the context of this presentation is from the perspective of medical students, like the purpose of these cases is to pose questions. So whatever questions you might have come up with are valid because um, we want to be thinking critically about the situation and that's what this is hoping to accomplish. Um, so with that being said, any volunteers to share what was discussed? All you have to share is a question. You can answer the question. Okay, but... Thank you. Thanks, Drew. Any
Thank you. So, um, to start off the discussion, um, so I'll share what we did in this situation, what happened. Um, so, some of the important questions were absolutely addressed by these points, like what what is this patient's medication regimen? Um, what is their access to healthcare like? So that was actually the most important question we felt like. Where is the nearest? In the case that my treatment that I have on hand is not sufficient, where is the nearest facility that would be the most convenient for this patient to be treated at? So Nick reviewed the first like primary care level center and the second level center. Um, what is the what what medica medical tools are available at those facilities? Um, and then what sort of transport considerations do we need to have for an individual who's elderly in a rural context to be able to get to that facility? Um, so in this case, uh, the local polyclinica had a nebulizer um, that we did not have, so we were able to transport the patient um, to that facility. We only had a means to transport um, within 20 minutes away with the truck. Um, in order to arrive at the second level center, we would have had to use a motorcycle for an hour, and the patient wasn't able to travel that way, so we were able to stabilize at a primary level. Um, but I think like what this case showed us is that most importantly, this patient, we reinforced and supported the existing public health system by demonstrating that not only did they actually have a more robust tool for this acute intervention, but they will continue to have it after we leave. So understanding what your local um, public health entity offers is very important. And then the discussion from that is um, what is the next uh, What's the change for our next trip that we can do? Um, in that we were discussing, like we're using an albuterol inhaler for the rest of the three weeks for other patients should they need it. Um, we had a Dominican physician with us who was able to like construct a cup to cut um, to reuse the like uh, oral mouthpiece for the inhaler, um, so that it could be used for multiple patients. Um, but so like a combination of creative strategy with understanding the local public health system. Anything to add to that? Okay, yeah. At any point, if you would like to add your personal experience or additional questions, please raise your hand. Okay, another volunteer for the next case. Anyone want to read? Awesome, Alex. Okay.
Okay, this is, I'm hearing the flutters of good conversation. Um, we want to say, emphasize that like the questions, we recognize again that this is interdisciplinary in context, so that we're not specifically looking for just medical questions or diagnostic even. Um, so Nick's going to go around the room. Would someone like to start by sharing the questions that came up? Good. regularly or not, but if you have this option, very low cost, like it's both any. Um, so what would you do in this scenario? Well, you see that it's not a hyper-emergency emergency with a You realize Hasn't had a medication, and he said this to a man. Um, you know, and it's as an other person or a combo. Um, so something patients issue. Oh, and likely to tell you yes, she has a credit card, and her young at the secondary care center. They're calling it, they'll just go to it, they'll get more referred to her. Whether they're doing it or not, is really need to make sure that these patients are going and having access. Um, and the best tool in case we have to waste the government. Have uh, if the prescription by my fine with um, their cardiology. Well, you see that you have in the clinic combo pill. Well, they're managed. Um, Also with that is it's always an opportunity when a patient comes to you with existing health care to reinforce that there's good care. Um, our role again as temporary providers is not only to like fill in the gaps, but 
also to support and strengthen the existing system. So in an opportunity like this, once understanding her care, to reinforce that you are offering similar medical recommendations. And then, um, as Nick said, uh, prescribe scripts that are um, use a bit readily available in the country where you are, um, rather than exotic medications that the patient will no longer be able to get once you leave. Either, it depends on the context, yes. So it, I like, like, we have Dominican providers and scripts that can be filled at pharmacies. Um, but in our case, even if you are dispensing medications from the uh, mobile pharmacy of your trip, um, it can be a practical way to kind of correlate that bridge. So um, as I said, say if like you know that enalapril is listed, is supplied by the local pharmacy, rather than provide, prescribing another ACE inhibitor, elect to prescribe that medication. So going along with it, um, actually, I think that's an excellent point, though, that family can provide insight into those behaviors that may or may not be obvious just on the initial clinic visit. It's so important. This is an excellent point, though, that we should be every every one of these questions is a good opportunity for creative improvement. So maybe we should be. That's a good. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, our next case, would anyone like to read it? It's a GYN case. Yay. Okay.
Okay, so a volunteer to start with the first summary of questions. We're going to start passing the mic just to make sure everyone's heard. I know some of you And of the questions was on
open like all the questions from a local pharmacy for the past 45 days in an effort to control her uh, bleeding. Um, she had failed therapy, uh, so what we were able to do, but this was all, as you mentioned, in the context of a complex social dynamic of an undocumented Haitian woman um, in a Dominican community that had varying degrees of acceptance and support of this woman and her partner. So um, the situation happened um, like late at night as well when there was limited transport available and the nearest um, facility was about an hour and a half away. They would be able to either stabilize her in terms of blood um, or insulin and be able to regulate labs. Um, so fortunately for us, we were able to, because we had established ahead of time an, a relationship with the primary care provider, the local polyclinica um, arranged a GYN referral for her to be directly admitted to the secondary center. Um, the only tools that we had available that were even remotely relevant to her care and intervention were one bag of normal saline. So. Um, we uh, use that to, as like a tie over until we were able to refer her directly to the secondary level of care um, where she was able to have her diabetes and um, bleeding managed. Um, so, I mean, when you have normal saline in a pregnancy test, your options are limited. Um, I felt like the strength of this case was understanding what are what can and I cannot do for this patient and then what resources can I use in terms of my privilege to mobilize to ensure that she gets care um, with the existing system. So, and I felt like your questions really spoke to that. So thank you. Does anyone have anything to add in light of that discussion? It absolutely did. I think in this case, we had established care, like a relationship with the primary provider. So he was willing to take any patients from our clinic and we had expressed explicitly that this is important. You are, like we request that you assist us in this manner. Um, but we did have anxiety sending her on to the secondary level center if the patient would be seen. So I think that, and when you have one provider for your entire triage clinic and other patients who are waiting to be seen, that's like a challenge that has to be balanced. Um, in this case, we sent uh, a community health worker with her as in, to be a uh, stand an advocate. But that is again, an informal, not existing channel. Yeah. So. is unique to every situation in the country specific context okay this is our second to last case it's a pediatric one would anyone like to read awesome thank you Good 
So, when I was in the HIV-L vaccine, and first we really need to look at the vaccine that doesn't destroy you. are a bit Not the best way to prevent interbrachial, but it's helpful. Other vaccines. I mean, in six months, where's her polio? Where's her pneumococcal? She did have those done. And now we're wondering about pentavalent vaccine. Well, pentavalent actually, yeah, and also hepatitis B, and also. So, She's pretty much up to go in and get her six month one. What are you going to do? You're going to refer her to follow because that's the institution. Um, so, really, have her uh, encouraged to. The last case is outside the context of the Dominican Republic. So Nick is currently getting his public master's in public health from the University of North Carolina, and this case was offered um, by a physician at that facility. So um, I'll read this. Imagine you are volunteering with the ICRC in Jordan at a Syrian refugee camp. Imagine that there's a prima para woman that's a first time pregnant woman in the camp who is at who at 2 a.m. begins to labor and is experiencing a large amount of blood loss due to partial placenta previa. Um, there's no OBGYN services offered at the camp. Um, how would you tap into the local medical services to resolve this case? And then what would be your plan of action? Uh, I'm on I know we have a few obstetricians in our midst, so everyone, Dr. Grace, the director of the Institute for Latin American Concern, she's sitting back there, so. Okay.
Anyone have these working in the middle? No. Uh -huh. oh. Oh. This organization actually is a project that did it. So this one luckily survived. Um, there are many They network local concepts. And in this story, something was empowering. Okay, this is the, the, our intention with doing this was to raise questions so that when you are either abroad or intervening in an underserved local situation in our country, um, that you feel comfortable asking them and then looking for answers. Um, I think personally that asking questions is the right thing to do. So a couple to sort of summarize our points for acute care and interventions. Um, what are the limits and abilities of my organization's resources for acuity? Um, what services are offered at each level of care in the existing public health system? And how can we transport patients to each facility in an emergency? And then finally, how can we transport workers and partners as well um, to each level of care in an emergency? And so the goals of this is to understand the limits of your clinic and also the services that you offer. Um, understand the specific medical services that are offered at each local level of intervention. Specific, like down to, is there insulin? Can they have IV bags? How is insulin administered? Those sorts of details. Um, and then establish a specific plan in advance for emergency transport, not only for your collaborative partners, for, but for also for patients.
So uh, just thank you for being here. I know we have all levels of learners. I want to speak to the importance of ourselves as educated, um, not only healthcare providers, like the educational privilege that we have um, to be able to participate in a conference like this on such an important weekend at this time in our country. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing. And I wanna encourage you to like, not only be advocates. I know this conference, like generally the focus is not only on abroad, but to be an advocate beyond our borders, but also at home for whatever that means um, in the current climate of our country. Um, and just thank you for being here and contributing your insight and experience and questions. That's all we have prepared.